In true crime, sometimes it's the quiet ones who make the most noise. Charlottetown, Prince Edward Island. Inside the provincial legislature, the leader of the opposition fields questions. Yes, uh, we have a limited amount of forestry. And Without warning, a bomb explodes. A bystander is wounded by flying shrapnel. Within days, Charlottetown police received two communiques claiming responsibility for the bombing. Both are signed by an unknown group calling itself Loki 7. After a year of silence, Loki 7 sends another communique. It contains a warning. There's an unexploded bomb concealed in a Green Gables bag, hidden among the tanks of a downtown propane compound. If this bomb goes off, it could wipe out most of Charlottetown. In true crime, investigation and conviction may take years. But every detective knows that the crucial clue is always there, somewhere in the first 72 hours. June 1996, a group called Loki 7 claims to have planted a bomb in the land of Anne of Green Gables. News of the bomb spreads fast. All eyes in Charlottetown are glued to the TV. The bomb squad searches among tightly packed and explosive propane tanks. They find the bag and inside a large pipe bomb. The countdown timer has stopped. But it could be booby-trapped. What the patrons of the local bar don't know is that if the bomb explodes, the blast will level a mile-wide radius of the city, including their bar. The bomb squad sends in a specially armed robot to destroy the device. Twenty-four hours after receiving the warning communique, the bomb is destroyed in a controlled explosion. Mike Quinn, a detective with Charlottetown Police, is in charge of the investigation. Two bombings, one year apart. What's happening to his gentle city? It's a small community area. Everybody pretty well knows everybody. The citizens and the community in, in general were, were quite uh, scared and, and upset. At the scene, Quinn himself leads the IDENT team as they gather shattered pieces of the exploded bomb. Well, the first thing we do, we secure the area and then begin our search looking for evidence that might lead us to the person that's responsible. The fragments are sent to Jean-Yves Vermette at the forensic lab for analysis and reconstruction. It's Vermette's job to determine how the bomb was made and its original dimensions. He's also looking for any telltale evidence of the bomber's signature. It was something that clicked in my mind that I'd seen something similar to this before. One year ago, Vermette reconstructed the provincial legislature bomb. He's convinced the new bomb was made by the same hands. The group Loki 7 clearly has an expert bomb maker. Mike Quinn realizes he needs help. He calls in the RCMP. Quinn's RCMP counterpart is Les Dell. They don't have a moment to lose. We set up the suspect list by going to our databases. We were looking for anything that was related to the bombings, whether they were high school kids putting bombs in mailboxes or people making bomb threats at companies, um, anything that was related to the word bomb. They generate a list of more than 30 suspect groups. 
Dell starts with the one clue the task force has, the communiques themselves. Each one of them would have a stylized swastika as a letterhead. Dell examines 23 known styles of swastikas displayed by skinheads and neo-Nazi groups. The Loki 7 symbol doesn't match any of them. But the name Loki is real to any student of mythology or classical music, is a spirit of evil, of flame and fire in Norse mythology. A lead character in Wagner's opera, Götterdämmerung, the twilight of the gods. But this is no help in determining whether Loki 7 is a group or an individual. Mike Quinn relies on his own gut instinct. There was no uh, street talk. There was no uh, uh, scuttlebutt uh, rumors around who might have been involved. So we pretty well determined that it was an individual who worked it on his own. An individual filled with venom and hatred. He was talking about uh, white supremacist stuff. He was. He didn't like the Jews, he didn't like big business, he didn't like politicians, he didn't like anybody in authority. To think about what kind of human being would actually, would actually compose them and then send them out to, for the world to see, it kind of alarmed us. Dell is intrigued by the similarities between the violent methods of Loki 7 and the infamous American Unabomber, recently captured by the FBI. Both expressed a violent hatred of society, and both communicated that hatred in typewritten messages. The first communique was typewritten, and it was typewritten with a Smith Corona portable typewriter. Um, that was right around the time that the Unabomber had been caught. Uh, there was a trial in the newspaper, and the evidence was coming out. The FBI had used his typewriter as evidence. And it was immediately after that, Loki disposed of his typewriter and started using press-on letters. Loki 7 is clearly learning from the Unabomber's mistakes. Now he photocopies his communiques, obliterating fingerprints. The envelopes are sealed with water, leaving no trace of saliva for DNA identification. We were faced with the idea that after an 18-year investigation with the FBI, and the Unabomber had just been caught. And we were thinking, oh my god, this is going to take us that long or even longer to find this person. But the task force doesn't have that kind of time. They know how narrowly they escaped disaster at the propane depot. We could have lost a great bit of Charlottetown. We could have had explosion after explosion after explosion. 72 hours into the investigation, the police still have no idea who they're looking for. Loki 7, the serial bomber, could strike again at any moment. After two months of investigation, police have narrowed their list of suspects to two dozen. Loki 7, the Charlottetown bomber, seems impossible to track. Then the task force gets a break. Reconstruction of the pipe bomb is completed, and Jean-Yves Vermet has a strong lead. It's probably one of the biggest pipe bomb in diameter I've I, I ever seen. Only specializing store will store this type of uh, pipe and caps, especially the caps, which are very rare to find. The unusual size of the pipe bomb is a massive break for the task force. The lead pipe was one of our biggest clues because it was a four-inch nipple, and this was exceptionally rare to use. It's an industrial tool, and we simply don't have any heavy industry in Prince Edward Island. Dell and Quinn are led to an industrial plumbing supplier several hours away in New Brunswick. The most interesting thing about this is that whenever a person purchases one of these nipples, they purchase one end cap. Nobody purchases one of these pipes with two end caps. Except to build a bomb. The clerk at the plumbing store produces a receipt for the purchase of a four inch filler pipe and two end caps. There's just one catch. He can't remember what the buyer looked like. So we asked uh, him to go under hypnosis. 
he gave the hypnotist a, a description. But it was interesting, all, all that came out on the sketch were um, the eyes and the nose. We later figured out that uh, that's probably all he was looking at because the wicket would only show the eyes and the nose in that particular part of the face. So we actually got a good, a good shot of his eyes, but that was it. We didn't, we didn't get the rest of his face. But they do have the receipt. The name on it is John McLeod. Calls soon eliminate all the John McLeods in the area. Now the task force has the suspect's alias and a sample of his handwriting. To check the handwriting of every potential suspect could take forever, but the Loki communiques suggest a way to shorten the list. Dell notices how well written they are. I took the communiques up to an English professor at the University of Prince Edward Island and had her look at them. And she looked at them and she told me that the grammar and the spelling in these communiques was better than the top 10% of her graduating class. So immediately we knew we were dealing with a well-educated individual. Using a good education as a guide, the list of suspects quickly comes down to five names. We went back to the suspect list and we had a lot of people on there who weren't very well educated, to say the least. And we're going through the list, and I asked uh, Mike, uh, who's this Roger Bell? And uh, Mike said, well, I th think he's a school teacher. A retired chemistry teacher, to be precise. Roger Bell was on the suspect list because in 1994, he ordered three books on how to make explosives from a US publisher. Customs sent us a little tip that uh, this person uh, has an unusual interest in explosives. Police attempted to talk to Bell on several occasions, but no one ever answered his door. We determined from people who knew him that he was very reclusive and, uh, you know, there was something wrong with Mr. Bell. Some of the st students told us that one day he, he came into the classroom and just stared out the window for the whole, the whole science class and didn't say a word and then walked out. Copies of Bell's old school attendance records where he has written both John and McLeod have been submitted to the RCMP for comparison to the plumbing store receipt. I was able to make a comparison between the, uh, the specimen signatures and the John McLeod signature on the receipt and I was able to say that he actually was the writer of that signature. So it seems Loki 7 is Roger Bell, the man who signed as John McLeod when he bought the pipe and end caps. That was a major turning point in the investigation. We were zooming in on him. We just didn't have enough evidence to convict him, even, even with that knowledge. Just because Bell bought the pipe and caps doesn't necessarily mean he built the bomb or sent the communiques to police. Bell is put under 24-hour surveillance. Police follow him for weeks, hoping to catch him in the act of constructing or planting a bomb. We watched his every move. He was never alone. I was sitting in the library doing surveillance. He had carried in a large bag full of something that was heavy, obviously, and we didn't know what it was. As we were watching them, a, a, a class came into the library. Here's a whole class we're sitting just feet away from this notorious bomber. And they had no, no idea what was in this sack. But today it's only books, not bombs, that Bell is carrying. We spotted him flying model airplanes in the park. Uh, he was using remote control devices to fly these airplanes. And uh, we were quite concerned that he might use these to set off bombs from a distance. Dell even tries to strike up a conversation with Roger Bell. I never once saw him speak, never said a word, and I, I, uh, I was really wondering whether he actually could speak or not. 
Without enough evidence to obtain a search warrant for Bell's apartment, police resort to more resourceful ways of learning Bell's secrets. They collect his outdoor garbage bags. It's clear that Bell is starting to destroy evidence. They find discarded clippings about the Unabomber and something even more disturbing. Here's these big pieces of paper with a human being on it and a bunch of bullet holes in it. And it kind of sent shivers up her spine that uh, he was actually thinking about assassinating somebody. Roger Bell is now armed and even more dangerous. Roger Bell, the suspected bomber and now potential assassin, has been under police surveillance for weeks. Police cannot arrest him unless he commits an openly illegal act, but Bell doesn't. Police get a break when Detective Quinn tracks down a relative of Bell who was once quite close to him. She provides insights into his character that complete the puzzle of Roger Bell. He's obsessed with his own superiority, believing he is a uniquely gifted human being. He feeds his fantasies with a steady diet of Wagner's operas, Nietzsche's elitist philosophy, and Nazi memorabilia. Long divorced, he's a bitter man, a powder keg ready to explode. But Bell has a long fuse. As the weeks turn into months, the relentless police surveillance work takes a toll on Detective Quinn. There was a lot of stress and everything, then I took a second in the middle of, uh, of the investigation. And I uh, had a heart attack and uh, went into intensive care and was off work for a couple of months. With Quinn out of action, Detective Dell gathers the task force to decide what to do next with Roger Bell. We debated whether we should arrest him. We were under pressure from the management of the RCMP and the management of the city police to wrap this up. We decided, okay, we've got enough grounds here to do a search warrant, but having grounds to do a search is not grounds, is not enough evidence to convict somebody. It's a tough call. Arrest him too soon and he might walk free. Wait until you find more evidence and he might strike again. It's a gamble either way. Dell makes the hard decision. Early morning, Bell's apartment. Roger Bell is taken down before he knows what hit him. I interviewed Mr. Bell for about eight hours, and he wasn't talking to us at all. He uh, would just stare at the wall, and uh, he would tell us his name, and that would be it. He just was not talking. I used every technique that I could possibly think of to get him to talk to us, and he, he remained totally silent which was frustrating, very, very, very frustrating. Bell knows police only have circumstantial evidence against him. Why should he talk, since police may have no choice but to release him? Detective Dell abandons his interview and joins the ongoing search at Bell's apartment. Boxes of material have been collected, but nothing to tie Bell directly to the bombs or the Loki 7 communiques. He had an art pad on his desk, and I held it up and I saw some scratches. And here is the stylized swastika. I said, boys, I found the swastika, and, and they were all jumping for joy. And that's not all. A box of items collected at Roger Bell's apartment is sent to documents examiner, Susan McKinnis. One of the documents in the box was actually a pad of paper, so I thought, well, He's probably had this under something, so there should be something indented on this one. Most people, when they use those dry transfer letters, just scribble over the top of them. Because this person was very particular and very precise, he 
he traced over each letter very carefully and because he did that he left really nice impressions. I did find indented on there the entire repetition of the last letter that he sent regarding the, um, the bomb at the speedy propane compound. The very communique that police received in the first 72 hours of the investigation. Overconfident in his persona as Loki 7, Roger Bell thought he could never be caught. He meant his bomb to cause havoc. But his deadly plan failed when the timer didn't work. Frustrated that his bomb didn't go off as planned, Bell chose to send police the communique demanding the bomb squad deal with his unfinished business. It was a mark of his character, this need for control, this striving for perfection. It's a shame that he uh, went this way because he could have been an extremely valuable member of society. Having been a teacher and having the knowledge that he had, he could have, he could have influenced lives in a positive way. But he didn't. He uh, chose to hurt people. Roger Bell pled guilty and was sentenced to 10 years in prison. He remains silent to this day. The stories on 72 Hours are true. The detectives and forensic scientists are the ones who actually worked on the case. The names of the victims are fictitious. The names of the convicted are real.